Okay, that's one o'clock, so I think uh, we should make a start. Everybody's very punctual these days now that we do these things online. Um, so um, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Ronan Lyons, who is Professor of Public Health at Swansea University. Uh, Ronan recently uh, got an honorary OBE for his services to research, innovation and public health. He graduated from Medical School in Trinity College, Dublin in 1983, he completed an MPH in 1988, an MD in 1993. Um, for the next wee while, he worked in hospital and community medicine, he trained in public health, he worked in West Glamorgan Health Authority in Swansea in 1992 and worked full time with the NHS until 1998. Deciding that he was interested in moving away from some of the managerial aspects of NHS commissioning, he also did some voluntary sessions at the local accident and emergency department. Uh, Ronan became interested in research. He did lots of research as an NHS employee and was um, taken up um, into an academic post uh, by Cardiff University in 1998 and joined the new medical school at Swansea in 2001 to avoid driving to Cardiff, which wouldn't be an issue anymore, of course. Um, through his interest in injury prevention and health informatics, he became a, a leader, uh, internationally recognised as a leader in routine data research. He's now the Director for Wales and Northern Ireland, Research Director of National Lead for Improving Public Health with Health Data Research UK. He's Associate Director of the Administrative Data Research Centre in Wales, Deputy Director of the National Centre for Population Health and Wellbeing Research. Um, and he's also uh, Associate Director, um, sorry, Co-Director of Advanced Solutions to Technology and the Secure e-Research Platform. Now, many of the people attending this meeting will know him because of his leadership at the Sale Data Bank. Um, and if you've used it, you'll know that it's a world class resource with a great reputation for a high quality, responsive team and being really open and accessible to researchers all over the UK. Sale has been crucial uh, for scientific research, not least during the COVID-19 pandemic, where it's produced really high quality information. So Professor Lyons is going to speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions. Um, if you can please refrain from using the chat for questions, but put them in the Q&A and I'll read them to them uh, at the end. And um, here's a technical challenge for you. If you can use your applause emojis uh, to welcome today as he talks to us about using an advanced routine healthcare data system to improve population health, clinical care and inform policy, the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Well, thank you very much, David. That was a fantastic um, introduction. So um, I'll just start on 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 the sorry, start on the slides here. If you can, you see those. Yeah, that's brilliant indeed. Anyway, so I won't go through the 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 long title, and um, since David basically introduced me so well, I won't go through the history of where I've come from and all of that business. I, I just point out that I'm sort of late to the game as an academic but haven't done too badly so for anybody whose career is a bit different or strange don't worry about that in the slightest um, so i will talk about really quite a bit of research that we've done and, and that many other people have done but i to be honest about this really is this is where team science works really well and so I wanted to pick up, put up the pictures of many of our team who've contributed to this over the years. Uh, and it's just absolutely brilliant working in a sort of multidisciplinary, multi-agency team science environment. So lots of people there who've contributed. I particularly point out the couple of people down on the bottom and right of the slide, Jan and Chris Davis, they're actually members of the public. And they have been and they and a large number of other people um, have been tremendously helpful in, in all the work that we've been doing. And I'll, I'll speak a bit about a bit more about that as I, as, I, as I go along. So just a bit about SAIL. Um, I wrote the original pre-grant to sort of set this thing up back in 2006 when we had a grant of £5,000 for thinking about bids that could be put in, and we, we wrote a, a bid about bringing data together. So it really got going, though, in 2008. Um, we spent two years thinking about it before we created it. 
And it was built from the ground up as a sort of safe and legal and a socially acceptable way to linkage and sharing. We did try to think of all of the banana skins that might come up along the way and design them out of the way. And I think we've been really successful in doing that. Um, Having data is one thing, but actually being able to share the data and make it available to a global community is, is another thing. And so we're lucky to be underpinned by this technical infrastructure, the secure e-research platform, which has largely been built by Simon Thompson and, 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 and David Ford. And the system is, is quite simple, is that no data leave, the model, the data are kept under control at all times. It's automated and secure. Um, we work hard on our trustworthiness. And so we basically provide data for research, um, community and public sector analytical teams. It's also worth pointing out that SAIL is not limited to Welsh data. It does contain huge amounts of Welsh data, but there are quite a number of other data sets which are there. Um, and there are many UK and international projects. So um, many of you may have heard of the five safes created by Felix Ritchie and there's uh, about how to do this. Um, and essentially that's the way our system works. We have safe projects, safe people, safe data settings and output. The whole concept is designed around privacy protection. And we have run hundreds, if not thousands of studies and we haven't had a problem. So there are lots of technical things um, which underlie that, which are listed on the, on the left-hand side. Um, I should, you know, in this world, you have to demonstrate how good you are. And we have, um, we are some of the earliest groups to actually apply for external validation of what we're doing through the ISO 27001, early accredited by the UK Statistics Authority. Um, we have external assessments every six months, um, which show how well the thing is, is protected. The anonymization component is not done in sale by a trusted third party, which is part of the NHS. And any projects that are proposed go through a review by um, an independent group. They're called the Information Governance Review Panel. There are no members of SAIL on that panel. A third of the members are members of the public. Um, and everything has strict permissions and data access aspects in it. Uh, just to say in 2011, um, we felt the need to really build upon our engagement with the public. And so there's a thing called the SAIL Consumer Panel. Um, it basically are, it, fun, it, it is completely populated by members of the public. They're involved in all aspects of sale from bids to dissemination and impact. I spoke to them this morning on a new project that we're proposing, which I, I, I bring up at, at the other end. And, you know, it's really fantastic. They, they also improve almost every project that we're involved with, with some of the suggestions in early phase. And usually we have members of them who are embedded in the project and follow it right through. Just to say, you can go on the SAIL website and go through uh, lists of all of the data sets. And so this is essentially what you might see um, at the beginning of it. And again, there for anybody who's got any queries, um, Cynthia is the best person to contact. I think it's one of the very few systems in the world which is actually truly globally accessible um, to researchers and other places. So there is no, uh, you don't get any favours for working in Swansea and accessing sale. It is the same for, for everybody. So I'm going to talk then uh, now about some of the projects that we've been doing and um, why we, what, what we've been doing with them and all that. So you can see um, different ones really. I'm just going to close that one now. So one of the earlier pieces of work we did was to create a complete cohort of children in the Welsh population called the Wales Electronic Cohort for Children or WEC for short, which at that stage had a million children in it. And we use it for a number of things, but 
I, I quite like visualizations and showing that the power of, of, of sample sizes. So, so this essentially graph comes from a paper that was published a good, good few years ago. Um, and then basically what it looks at is, if you like, survival curves looking at the probability of just admission to hospital for any reason up to five years of age. And then it breaks that down by gestational age. Um, and you can see the weeks that are there. But what you can actually see visually, and it stands out statistically, that it's even possible to demonstrate the difference between being born at 39 weeks of gestation versus 40 weeks. And, and this is um, a nice demonstration of, uh, I'm just going to move another picture out of the way. Yeah, there we are. Um, so it's really helpful. And we've used the data for lots of things. So you can see down at the bottom, there's another one looking at when we link these data to households and we look at the health of individuals and households, how the health of individuals and the households can then have an impact on some of the health experiences of, of, of children. A, another area uh, that's quite important in all these things is reproducible methods and algorithms. And we've been doing quite a lot of work with, with frailty. Um, and there's an electronic frailty index created by Andy Clegg in sort of in Bradford, really. It's a cumulative deficit model. Um, it quite neatly takes 36 constructs in primary care and then categorize people into whether they're fit, have mild, moderate or severe deficit. And we were validating this against the implementation in, 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 in England. Just, um, oh, there we go. So one of the things about this is that it's quite a good predictor of what happens to people early on. So again, if we take a total population and um, we look at them over five years, and characterize them at the beginning, whether they were fit or um, had various frailty levels and see, see what happens. So you can see that for the most severe frail, frail group, almost everybody is admitted to hospital um, within five years. So it's a predictor, a good predictor of lots of outcomes and we, we use it quite often. Another area that we, we've been looking at, things that our different groups have been looking at, um, the data for hypothesis generation. And, and this is a, a, a report from a piece of work that we've also carried out with Scottish collaborators, Tim Wilkinson and, and Christian and Cathy from um, Glasgow and Marion also. Um, and we we're basically, they were looking at dementia and how drug prescriptions may be associated with it through a medication-wide association study. And so the next slide is a, an indication of this from, from their paper. Um, and basically this essentially shows you that there are large numbers of medicines which are, are associated with dementia and, um, and that. But this is about hypothesis generation rather than proving anything. Um, it does give some sort of areas where uh, further research is indicated as to why certain drugs might be here. Of course, there are many, these sort of hypothesis generation um, ideas come up with all sorts of uh, results, the vast majority of them, which will not be caused, of, but, but be due to various factors. But it is a, it's quite an interesting area to look at. Once I'm at that, I thought I'd just talk a bit, the, the MRC's dementia platform, because the SERP group also um, look after uh, the data portal. Um, and the reason I'm pointing this out to you is this basically provides access to some 50 or so cohorts, increasingly with linked and other data. Um, it's been funded for another five years. It's one of the few places where you can actually acquire free data without charge because it's already being funded. And I just want to say for anybody who's interested in dementia research, um, please have a look at the, uh, the MRC's dementia platform. So getting a bit more into um, 
data uh, and putting data together. One of the things in, in recent years has been a lot of interest in, in multimorbidity. And so we've created a thing called the Wales Multimorbidity Cohort, which took all of the people alive in 2000, and they're followed up in this one up to the end of 2019 from many different data sets. It's tuna, just under 3 million people, uh, 46 million years of follow up, um, and many different um, algorithms around phenotypes, Charleston, Alex Harris, or Coif and Caliber have been implemented and the protocol has been uh, uh, published it's there on the right hand side. So just a, a couple of looks at things like that. Uh, you can use it for many different ones. This one here is essentially has these nice circular bar charts which look at the prevalence of various conditions in different disease areas. Um, at different age groups. So on the right hand side, people in their 70s and, and those in their 20s on the left hand side. And of course, they, they vary um, enormously. <clears throat> We're also particularly interested in deprivation, socioeconomic um, issues and how they impact, impact on people. And here you can see very simply, you know, we have massive inequalities in health in Wales. Um, and they appear at very, er very early ages. And you can see them here just demonstrated by survival curves in this for people in the 60s on the right hand side and people in the 40s on the left hand side. And no matter how young we go, we, we, we see these differences. There are um, a whole range of different <coughs> analytical tools which are being looked at around how do we sort of really get our head around clustering in, in multimorbidity. Uh, just point here to um, one of our researchers who's doing quite a nice bit of work on this, James Rafferty, um, ad adapting things like hyper networks and about how these relationships there. But what I quite like about them again is the sort of visualizations that you get on the right hand side about how all of these diseases relate to each other at least and in a cross-sectional basis um, and again his um, his uh, publication is there on the left side another area that um, we're currently looking in at is the um, <coughs> outcomes of people with multimorbidity. And this is work um, led by Rhiannon Owen, um, a statistician with us who's come from Leicester, looking at multi-state modeling of disease trajectories. So on, on her visualizations here, you can see everybody starts off healthy and to simplify it, she's basically decided we, we'll only look at three different diseases, A, B, and C. And so people will accrue those over time. They will accrue pairs of them and then they will accrue triplets. And of course, they may die at, at, at any particular time. So the next part of that was to say, well, she took an example and took three, three diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and peripheral vascular disease. And again, this basically tells you how many people fit into that in this cohort over time. So on, on the right hand side, if we look at the people with the triads of disease, the groups are somewhere between 500 and three and a half thousand. Don't forget this is um, out of two and a half um, or nearly three million people. And again, then looks at the state occupancies of these. So you can see the, um, over time, the otherwise healthy people, everybody starts like that and that decreases over age. And of course, the likelihood of dying increases over age and also then the likelihood of picking up the various conditions. So that's coming. So and really what we've just shown here in that box at the bottom there, which is blown up on the right hand side, the um, when these conditions and their accumulations happen. Now, if I just move on then to, to the next part of this, which is really about demonstrating their survival probabilities. And, and here in the black line, you can see this is the group for the otherwise healthy. Um, the 
group in the middle, which is diabetes, and then the diabetes, hypertension, and peripheral vascular disease is on the left-hand side. So you can see big differences in their survival, um, depending on what conditions people have, as, as you would expect. And the next one then just looks at the loss and expectation of life with all of these combinations. So if you look at the blue grouping to the right, everybody here has all three combinations. And what she's been looking at, does it make a difference as to which condition um, appears in front of another one? And it seems to do so with the people who've got diabetes first, then develop hypertension, peripheral vascular disease, seem to have um, substantially, this is all statistically significant, lower life expectancies than the other combinations. Another um, piece of work which is ongoing is that recently we have um, acquired a, a new set of data called WRRS, the Wales Result Reporting Service. And this is essentially a all laboratory tests on all people for all conditions. It's a massive data set. It takes quite a lot of time to get through it uh, because essentially it was culled together from 12 different labs over time. So for instance, if you're searching for things like full blood counts, there are at least six different versions of that in the database that need to come together, largely because they've been named like FBC or capitals, lowercase, or with or without dots and all of that. Um, but this group is a respiratory group and they've been looking at, for instance, people who've been admitted to hospital with COPD and then looking to see, well, which laboratory results could you link them to? And virtually 100% can be linked to laboratory results. But they were particularly interested then in sputum and virology. Um, I, I, it's, it's interesting still that 80% of people admitted to hospital with respiratory conditions do not appear to have any sputum sent in laboratories. Um, so early days yet, um, but actually we think this is a, a really promising data set. Going to talk, you know, um, when I was asked to give this talk, I said, well, I didn't want to talk about all the stuff we were doing. And I knew David was doing work with sale as well. So I thought, well, I'll show some of um, some of his works. Um, and his, his studies are really are about comorbidity and representativeness of people with multimorbidity in, in, in trials. And so what he's been doing here is comparing trial participants with population data from sale. And so on, on, on the right hand side, you have a graph which um, says gives the, the x axis has the given comorbidity count. Uh, sorry, the y axis is the percentage with a given comorbidity count. The x axis is the comorbidity count. Blue is the trials and pink is sale. So you can see that quite a lot of them overlap, but in general, there is more comorbidity in the, in the routine data than there are in trials. And on the bottom side of that one is the percentage with specific comorbidity and the red dots are the individual trials. So you can see in general, whilst there's quite a bit of comorbidity or multimorbidity in trials, um, there's a lot more in the community um, data. And then his second one is uh, uh, about treatment for, for people who are on renin angiotensin aldosterone system in, inhibitors. And again, they're looking at trials and they're looking at routine data and then seeing what the rates of serious adverse events are. Um, and what, what basically you have here is the Red dots are the SAE rates in standard trials, blue dots in trials of older people, and then the purple dots, in, which is the routine data. And it, what it shows is that the community rates are consistently higher than the trial rates. But actually that the SAE events can be used to assess trial representativeness, which I, th I think is a really um, helpful thing. I'll turn now for a little bit on to linkage to non-health data, something that we've been doing for um, uh, quite a good number of years. Um, and we're particularly interested in how we could use this 
to um, evaluate the effects of non-healthcare interventions. And I'll, I'll go through some examples of that. Um, we have a system now in SAIL, which is sort of led by, by Richard Fry, in which we can actually not just anonymize individuals, but individual homes and households, farms and schools. Um, and that's been enormously helpful in looking at the various sort of questions. There's some publications here about home modifications, care and repair type activity. Does it work? Does it not work? Um, the adverse childhood experience in households and academic achievement and the improvement of, of neighbourhoods. So I'll just go a little bit more in depth about some of them. Um, this is a study which I led um, a number, a good few years ago, really, and there is fantastic observational evidence about strong housing and health, health relationships, but actually very few large scale evaluations. And here we were uh, fortunate to get funding from the NIHR to evaluate what you call a natural or I call an unnatural experiment through um, linking multiple um, data sets. And this was around um, an, an investment that was happening in Carmarthenshire, just in, in West Wales, in which they were spending £200 million to make nearly 10,000 homes fit for, fit for people back in between 2008 and 2015. Doing all these sort of works that are, are listed there on the bottom end of the slide. Um, the, uh, the houses were also externally beautified, which is quite interesting. And so you can sort of see what places looked like on the left hand side before um, and before and after. This is the sort of same same road. And but our, we were essentially looking at this to sort of power some outcomes. And in this particular study, we're looking at the impact of cardiorespiratory events in hospital data in those age 60 plus. So this is essentially just a map of um, Camartonshire behind. It, eventually in the intervention group, we had 32,000 people who lived in these houses at some stage, and that was compared to 231,000 of the, the general population. So you can see very large numbers of observations on them all. Um, one of the things that's quite important in all of this is to be able to track movement. And you can see that over that period of time, half the people moved. It's quite important to be able to take that into account for the periods followed up. But it did show essentially almost a 40% reduction in cardiorespiratory admissions in a difference in difference approach. <clears throat> Another area that we've been looking at, um, again funded by the, the NIHR, is this. Um, Chalice project, project, which basically looks at the change in access to alcohol over time and how that relates to lagged health events. So this is not um, a cross-sectional um, analysis. It's an analysis about change in access that naturally happens as places open up and they close down. So the first thing to note is that we have a lot of alcohol outlets. Um, so every blue dot is one, and they were tracked over this, this length of time. And then how far everybody was away from them, either by a 10 minute walk or 10 minute drive was measured. So two and a half billion calculations. And, but the group essentially came up with some really interesting um, evidence. So, and you could see it, it happened whether things were getting more difficult or less difficult in terms of access. But the change in walking distance was indeed related to admissions from alcohol-related conditions, injury and violent crime. I, I didn't mention in the background, we are also using police crime data in that. Another one was this um, natural experiment of um, air pollution. So in South Wales, a, there is um, an area called Port Talbot, has one of the major steelworks here and produces quite a lot of pollution also adjacent to the M4. Um, and you will have seen that the government advertises that people, when there are high pollution episodes, they should try to stay away from them. Most of the pollution studies have been done are about forecasting. 
but at this stage, they got European money to do live alerting system in that neighborhood. And so we recruited people through general practices in the only four general practices in the area uh, who would sign up to receiving these alerts or not and then track over time and again look at what made a difference difference to a difference difference approach everybody expected this to actually improve the health of people and reduce health service utilization the results were unexpected those who received the alerts were twice as likely to turn up in the emergency department and four times as likely to get admitted to hospital um, and as a result of that that intervention was subsequently cancelled I'll turn now to COVID a bit. Um, when that happened, we turned the Wales multimorbidity cohort on its head, created another entire population data set with all of the sort of data flows that you can see on, on the left hand side. Um, and again, the protocol was published in BMJ Open, you can see there on the right. I'd just like to acknowledge the people who funded, particularly the UKRI Medical Research Council and various other people, and I won't go through the list of people again, time. Um, so we basically put ourselves um, at working for our Chief Medical Officer and Chief Science Officer, and there were lots of areas that they were interested in, but particularly around transmission, vaccination, and monitoring indirect effects and, and the effectiveness of countermeasures. So we focus quite a bit on that. There's been quite a number of papers have come out. Um, I just put up some here uh, for examples, but I'll, I'll go through two of them in, in, in a little bit of um, detail. So the first one is about school bubbles transmissions. Um, what we've been able to do was to anonymize the entire population and all the children. And so they, they are there as individuals within their households and within each of the schools that they're in. And linked into that are all of the school staff and all of the households of all of the school staff. And then we can look at when there is a case appearing anywhere, what is the likelihood of cases occurring the next case occurring in, 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 in that as grouping so that I, I wouldn't spend a huge amount of time on on this table but you know the first line really with the odds ratios of nearly 40 and 9 show the sort of household transmission which is stronger than anything else but if you wander down towards the bottom end of the slide we're still able to show that when there are cases within a school, those cases also increase the likelihood of other children in that household. And even if the cases in, that happen in the households of teachers um, happen without the teacher being ill, you can still see patterns of transmission to the children. Of course, that goes against the background of lots of people having asymptomatic infection. One of the other areas was um, early, early looking at what was in our care homes, because we have a system of tracking everybody in care homes. And so the, these this is just a simple survival curves. Um, you can see the survival curves of people in care homes for the five years before COVID happened, which is very similar. And then the green one after COVID. So we had effectively about a 70% increase in mortality in our care homes as a result of, of COVID. We've also been working um, with inequalities and uptake, um, particularly with Public Health Wales. One of our difficulties is that we don't have fantastic um, data on ethnicity. We've used many different sources of data in the NHS not to do it. But it still misses a lot and we got permission to link in the 2011 census and that's now being actively used as, as a way of looking at inequalities and again you can just see that we have some fairly massive inequalities in uptake of our vaccines um, that some of that was published in, in vaccine but it's updated on a weekly basis by Public Health Wales who are also using it to try to improve uptake. Um, Again, we've also started working collaboratively with lots of others, and this is uh, 
the collaborative work we had through the DAC fact coordination, um, I, you know, led by Aziz Sheikh uh, with, with other colleagues. Um, this one is on side effects of vaccines. Uh, we are replicating a lot of these in, in Wales. And just on the right hand side of them, there is where we're, we're starting to use now the laboratory data to look at vaccine induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. We're finding that actually many of the people who are described as having thrombocytopenia in the routine data, strangely enough, do not have low platelet counts or platelet counts that actually back that up. And given that we have access to all of the laboratory results, that, that one is a bit surprising. So it's an important area for further development. Uh, I'll just show a little bit now about some other work we're, we're doing. Uh, along this one, this is Stuart Bedston's um, work in DACFA. Um, and this is essentially about what's our uptake and effectiveness in healthcare workers. Um, one of the things we got as permission as part of COVID was the ability to link in all healthcare employees in, into the data set. And so we've been looking at those, those different groups. So here on the left side is just a sort of um, a data visualization of where we are. That's, this is a little bit behind now, as you can see, it's back to May um, from, from his paper on uptake of vaccines. And on the right hand side then is essentially what the uptake looks like in the different staff groupings. Um, so there's some quite considerable differences, um, differences by age and ethnicity. This is at, obviously at a, a point in time and, and changes. And again, this where, these are the visualizations of the effectiveness of the um, vaccines. So in the first dose, as you can see, and it's been reported in quite a number of studies, effectiveness doesn't appear to really show until at least 14 days afterwards. And there's a substantial decrease um, or substantial improvement in effectiveness, which wanes a bit over time. And again, you can see what the second dose is, happens after that, which is much, much better. Um, there are lots of these that I could go into in great detail. We did look at whether there's any difference between staff groups and all that, but there's nothing really there, there to report. I'll um, coming towards a bit towards the end of it now. Um, one other area that we, we've been working quite um, a lot with is the uh, cancer registry group in, in, in Wales, um, led by, by Dovet Hughes. And so part of this was looking at indirect effects on presentations. And what we noticed back in, in that year, we had very substantial reductions in the expected number of cases that we saw. And we we're particularly looking at three cancers, female breast, colorectal, and non-smell lung cancer, small cell lung cancer, which decreased by the amount that you can, you can see there on, on, on the screen. And then just visually, you can see this was done by, by monthly, essentially. The dark lines there were essentially what happened in 2019. And the, the lesser shaded lines essentially in 2020. The patterns are not exactly the same for each of the cancers. And then the next thing that we were able to do then was to sort of work out why. And so we were able to link the data to um, the mode of presentation, whether that was GP unscheduled care through screening, through emergency departments. And again, on this slide, you can see the difference that the various modalities make. So we did pause breast cancer screening for several months during it. And you can see that has had a, a, a major impact. And you can see how the other ones that have, have changed also over time. So one of the other parts, which I've been, I like more and more about this, is actually we're doing more collaboration across the UK. Um, and this is a, another example of collaboration between Wales and Scotland, where actually at this stage, we've got joint analysis of data in Scotland and Wales. Uh, particularly, this was looking at the impact of COVID um, on COPD. It's one of the few areas where, COVID appears to have had a good impact. 
there was substantial drops in hospitalization as people isolated from each other and weren't infected, and also drops in mortality in, in this group. And I'm going to basically just come to, if you like, my, my last slide now about the future, really. And the future, I think, is about um, increasing the breadth and depth of data and collaboration at the national and um, international scale. We, there are, we have hoovered up, I'd say, with InterSail, the vast majority of coded data. And we have been working a bit on uncoded data. Um, on the left-hand side is an example of a, a publication around NLP and how, the, how that's uh, working in neurology departments around epilepsy. I have another sort of role in that I chair the advanced analytics group for the Digital Health and Care Wales. And we're trying to sort of bring together academia and the NHS more about how do we access and utilize the, um, the written language and text data like radiology reports, clinical letters and all of that for the benefit of the NHS as, as well as research. And then on the right hand side is where trying to catch up when we know that Scotland is far ahead of us in this about anonymizing um, images and bringing those into um, making them available for researchers around the world. So I think those are two of the big areas that we're, we're going to develop um, in, in the next sort of six months or year and that. And I think that's me run through. Um, so perhaps I should just stop stop sharing then, David. Yes, please. Thanks very much, Roland. That was very interesting. Um, it was great to see that you did a study into an intervention, showed it wasn't effective, and then it actually stopped. I think yeah. that might be the, <laughs> the first we, we, have a we have a couple of those. I, I could have done another example, the prismatic trial. Um, again, based on sort of theory, there, there was a theory that if you risk stratify the entire population, and basically sent their risks to the GPs. The GPs would basically turn, do something different and fewer people would go to hospital. And um, Helen Snooks managed to sort of delay an intervention, get funding for a cluster randomized trial, which basically showed that not only did it not work, but it increased costs on activity. And so we don't do that now in Wales. And I think there are an awful lot of these things you know, it can save society and people a lot of money in grief in as much of not doing things that don't work as in finding things that work better. Hmm. Um, now, if people, they could either post questions in the Q&A, and I'll read them out if you like, or, it, oh, here's one. Um, we've got a question. Has SAIL tried to obtain tax or benefit system data? That's and from someone called P. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, yes, for at least 15 years, and we haven't given up yet. Uh, we're still in negotiations. Um, you know, both of those would be fantastic. I mean, I, I always think, right, if you put your head and your mindset and the person in the treasury, and the treasury people are very important because of how money is spent. So what do they want? It's really simple, right? They'd like the NHS to exist, but everyone would be so healthy they didn't use it, right? They want everybody to do well at school so they'll become essentially higher taxpayers. Um, they'd like everybody to be employed so there's no DWP, um, fewer people in prison and hardly anybody in a care home. So if you think about those as social outcomes that are desirable, being able to measure what the impact of any intervention on them is really important. And so things like, you know, tax and benefits data are really important. And if we could get those linked in, then we'd be able to assess a lot of our interventions on broader outcomes. So, well, but we haven't got, we're not giving up. It's, uh, you know, the battle continues. <laughs> um, and we've another question here from uh, Ruth Dundas. And I was going to say, if, if anyone would rather see their own question, put your hand up and I think I'm able to activate your microphone. Um, so they said, fantastic to hear about all the research using SAIL. I completely agree. Um, 
And Ruth would like to know more about the sale consumer panel and how it works and how they got people to contribute and mentioned that it's very hard to recruit people for a general population health project without a disease to kind of hang it on. Yeah, so, I mean, we we were lucky to be able to build in some funding for this in our bid to Welsh Government about how important proper engagement with the public was. And so they fund that component. And uh, so we went out to recruit people from all walks of life and all age groups. And we worked really hard in, 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 in doing that. As I said, I spent 40 minutes with them earlier today about um, what did they think about anonymizing and bringing in images and that. And, and it's really good because they come from all sorts of different walks of life and that, um, you know, um, there's always somebody who has a real interest in it. So I, I, I mean, I would encourage anybody who's doing that to do it. And then again, what you say is, well, well, at the same time, well, if this goes through and is approved, actually, are there any members of the community who would like to be embedded within the study? And I remember the one we did on housing was brilliant because we had members of the Netley Tenants Association, when the results were being launched, standing on the same platform as our first minister launching them and, and launching them to their own communities. So it's, it's really good. And um, Jill Pell, let's ask her question, um, has asked, uh, are you allowed to use routine data to identify and approach eligible people to obtain consent to recruitment for trials and cohorts? So that thorny issue of, um, of, of going back to the data, back to people. Yeah, not quite yet, but we, we are in discussions about how that, that could be done. And I mean, I, later today, have a discussion which Welsh government have got with people about how that can be done in a way which which doesn't put people's identity at risk. We've recently had approval, um, and this is again um, replicating a bit of Jill's work, is looking at shielding population, about going back out to the shielding population and controls and um, getting questionnaires done and also blood for immunology. So we have a sort of system where we can reverse it through the NHS and if there are additional permissions to do it. It's, it's, it's clunky, but it's something that we, we are working on. Great, thank you. And, and we've got a question here from um, Lily Wee. Um, Lily works with me here and she said, that's a great talk. I was wondering how representative the sale data is for a specific disease area in Wales or a broader population. And I'd like to add to that question, if I may. Um, sometimes we've had points from reviewers saying, but Wales. Um, uh, what, and, 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 and also similarly, we've had ones before, like, but Scotland. So how do, yeah. you, um, how do we persuade our transatlantic colleagues? That I, I know. Well, I, can... and Wales is less known than Scotland across, across the pond, really. Um, we do actually. I've just. I was looking today at, at one about representativeness. It's now about the gin. See, we have the data on all of the population for everything apart from the GP data, which I just saw now is about eighty four percent. And there is work gone on the background. Well, you know what difference does it make? You know how representative they are. And it's interesting because the choice to go into this is really by practice, not by person. Um, there's very few differences from the general population in the sale of participating practices. It largely seems to have come around around the personality of practice managers or not whether they could be bothered at a point in time. But it's very close to what the general population of sale is like. Great, thank you. And um, Kate O'Donnell's asking, um, COVID has highlighted the inadequacy in many countries of data in relation to ethnicity. And she'd like to know a bit more about how that's been addressed in Wales. I know you mentioned in the, the census, but, but to find out a little bit more about that and what we can learn from that in Scotland. Yeah, I, what if, I mean, I, I sit on lots of different committees. So one of them is our First Minister's Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic Committee around COVID. Um, and they were absolutely the popular, which has representatives from many ethnic groups and that on it. And they were absolutely delighted with the linked census data being able to show how well served or not their communities were. Um, 
And everybody is up for about how to improve it. The only question then is how do you do that um, with the population? You know, strangely enough, ethnicity is a mandatory field in lots of our NHS data collection. And, and it's missing in, in large numbers. And we also have different ethnicity groupings being used over time. So bringing them together is a bit of a trick. But also with the debate in that community was interesting. It's quite difficult to get agreement on what ethnicities people wish to be referred to for that. And if you have too many choices, the thing becomes so difficult that fewer people complete them. Um, John Cleland, do we have religion uh, surrogate for ethnicity? Well, in the census, we do have religion, but not, not otherwise. Um, and I have another kind of question. It might be a wrap up question, depending how many more we've got. It's a, it's a two questions. So it's, I'd be interested to know how you balance kind of building infrastructure and making sale available to people in the UK and internationally against producing research as a group. And another kind of linked question is what's around the corner for sale and for breaching data more generally? Um, so the balance of it, so it started off as a small research project. Um, as it developed, it's now funded as an infrastructure by, by Welsh government, but really they only pay for a bit. And it's because of our success through ADR and HDR and all sorts of deep UK and other things that we've been able to build, if you like, an infrastructure around it. Sale itself is now um, not funded to do any research at all. So it purely is as an infrastructure to, su to support research. Um, and it's uh, like beg, borrowing and stealing, trying to keep things going from multiple people, as, 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 you, as you can well imagine. Um, where is it going? Um, I think the areas that need to expand are about how we get, you know, more detailed information from NLP in clinical correspondence. I have no doubt that if you look at any doctor's letter to another doctor about somebody, probably only 5% of that ever gets coded. And there's huge intelligence and meaning that could come out of that. So that, I, I think there is a lot of machine learning, AI type approaches around images that will come in. And then I think the link to those social outcome data, uh, you know, the tax and the benefits and that are really important. And if you could get all of those things together, um, you know, many different things would be good. I mean, there are many other data sources that you could bring in if you think. I mean, they're all sort of like wearables, etc. Um, they tend to be a bit study specific. Um, I, you know, making sense of them is also quite tricky. Tricky. We are short on genetic data. We don't have genetic profiles enough. We're hoping over time that would also change. And then I think where things are going also is a bit more in replication and federated analysis across different um, groups. So that you really would be, be in a brilliant position if you could run an analysis in Wales on the Welsh data, the same analysis would run in Scotland and England and many other countries. Um, and you could get sort of scale and also you know, check whether or not the relationships hold in, in the different um, geographies. Great, that's really helpful. Well, um, I think, you know, you were very quick in your talk, Ronan, and um, I don't think we should keep people uh, beyond the time. Now, is, have you any last parting thoughts or anything? I see that John Clellan asked if we can get access to, um, is it easy in Glasgow to get access to sale? And I, I can testify that yes, it's very easy to get access to sale. Dare I say it's actually easier to get access to sale data in Glasgow than it is to get access to Scottish data in Glasgow. Um, so, so that's an answer yes to that. I don't know if you have any last minute thoughts yourself, Ronan, or? No, I, I think the sale system is one of the really few open ones to everybody. Uh, and it would be absolutely brilliant to see more of those develop. I mean, I know Scotland has done fantastically well with the EADS2 work around COVID, but I know that's under the sort of COVID copy regulations. And I'm hoping that people see the benefit of, you know, 
keeping the data available for many, many other purposes once that, that comes to an end. Great, great. Well, th again, thanks very much for coming. Uh, we've, we've, we've enjoyed it. I'm sure that people can get in touch with um, Cynthia, wasn't it, if they have any yeah. specific questions about accessing data and uh, if they have any other questions. And I'm if sure. somebody, anybody wants to email me about the question I haven't answered, I will try to answer it or put them in contact with the appropriate person. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you everyone for coming. You're very welcome and thank you for inviting me. It's been a Bye. great pleasure. Bye-bye.